name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There was a priest who was having a terrible, terrible nightmare, an awful nightmare. And part of the nightmare is that he was preaching. And he woke up, and he was. I suppose that's why Mary Kramer has written on the front of my little book, Sermon, to remind me that that's what I'm to be about, preaching the sermon. We came in singing a wonderful hymn, Holy, 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 and um, growing up in the Methodist Church, I knew from an early age that that hymn was number one in the old Cokesbury hymnal, right? And as a young boy, I realized early on that changing books was always thin ice. That when they took the Cokesbury hymnal out of the Methodist Church, there were almost riots when they brought in that blue-backed, heresy-filled hymnal. But if you only had one hymn to begin a hymnal with, what better hymn could you have than one that's glorifying the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. What a great hymn. The drama that is called St. Mark's Gospel is this. In spite of all the things that Jesus does, his disciples fail to get the point. I preached a few Sundays back. My friend Father Lamont Wilsey refers to the disciples as the disciples. Remember? You know, they just don't get it. And the reason that it's a, it's a, a, a drama is that, see, we have the perspective from Pentecost. And so when we see Jesus doing all the things that Jesus does, healing people, uh, taking a little bit of bread and fish and feeding the multitude and walking on the water, we get it, don't we? It's like an inside joke that we understand that the punchline is that the disciples just never do. Here they're with him day and night for three years, and uh, even though he's healing the sick, they don't quite get it. When he stills the waters, again, they miss the point. Even his suffering and death, they miss that too. They just don't get it. And when the curtain comes down on the Gospel of Mark, they still haven't been infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. It kind of leaves us hanging, doesn't it? But thanks be to God, we have that vision of Pentecost. We're able to not only to hear the gospel message, but we're able to internalize it. We're able to place it within our heart. The gospel writers, um, uh, hearers, the disciples just don't get it, but we do. So we have the beauty of Pentecost on our side. In other words, we have been infused with the power of the Holy Spirit, and so we see things that other people don't seem to see. And I think part of the reason why our fellow citizens that we live with from day to day don't see miracles around them on a constant basis like you and I do is that their their hearts have become hardened. They don't see people that are fed with the Holy Spirit. They miss out on that too because, again, their hearts have become very hard and and it's hard to break into those hearts. They need a renewed spirit, but it's almost virtually impossible to enter into those hardened hearts. They never have an abundance of grace like you have in your life because why? Their hearts are so hard. Now, being 72 years old, and it still kind of scares me when I think that I'm 72 years old. You know, on the television, when they say that a celebrity is is 72 years old, I always say, golly, that person's old. Then I think, well, I'm that old. But anyway, being 72, the music that impacted my life was music from the 50s and the 60s. I'm a rock and roller, true and true. And the music that touched my heart as a youngster was 
rock and roll music. And one of those singers was a, was a singer that I wasn't particularly fond of, but he sang one song that may have been his principal song in his career. It was by Gene Pitney. Anybody remember Gene Pitney besides me? Okay, there's two people. Two people, three people that remember Gene Pitney besides me, four. And his song was this, Only love can break a heart. And only love can mend it again. In a way, Gene Pitney's song to me sums up the gospel message. Because only Jesus can break into a hard heart. And through his love and mercy can mend it again. I will never ever forget as a young boy, I think I was maybe seven or eight, I went with my mother to St. Patrick's Hospital in Lake Charles to see one of her friends, and walking down the corridor was a statue of Jesus with his sacred heart exposed. Can you imagine a little Methodist boy seeing that for the first time? At first I was kind of horrified, but I was kind of drawn to it. This exposed heart of Jesus surrounded by that, that crown of thorns. And all of a sudden, as a young boy, it spoke to me. It spoke to me of the goodness of Jesus' heart. Because only love can break a heart. And only love can mend it again. Gene Pitney was right. And as a young boy, that was a sermon in plaster that spoke to my heart. And I think started the process of kind of breaking me down and building me back up. Let me tell you, it's still a work in progress, friends. I've got a long way to go. But I think it was those little things like that that helped me to move forward. You see, Jesus' ministry, even though he's surrounded by a multitude, the crowd, he was focused on 12 hearts the disciples. And he knew that if he didn't break into those hearts, that his ministry would be absolutely a failure. He had to break into those hearts and then mend them again in the likeness of his heart so that they could get it. And they eventually, as we all know, did at Pentecost or we wouldn't be sitting here today because it's through them and others that the message of Jesus Christ came to us and bore fruit within our lives. You know, Jesus wants our hearts to change as well. And for me, it began as a little boy. And it doesn't matter if it began with you as a child or as a teenager or in college or maybe maybe just today it doesn't matter as long as god is starting to break down your heart of stone to give you a heart of compassion and love not only for the lord god almighty but for the people around you now the gospel that we heard proclaimed this morning to me only makes sense if you hold the Bible in one hand and a map of Israel in the other. You have to be able to see where the story is going. So right, right after Jesus' miracle of feeding all those people, all of those people with, with uh, five loaves and two fish, and remember there was an abundance left over, uh, he sent his disciples off to Bethsaida in a boat. And then he went up into a high place to have solitude with his heavenly Father. If you'll go back and comb through scripture, after Jesus does something major, he needs to go off to be refreshed. He realized that ministry is a time of work and it's also a time of being refreshed by the Spirit. And that's something that each and every one of us needs to re remember is that we have to go through times of, of activity and also times of drawing back and being refreshed by the 
Spirit of the Lord God Almighty. So that's what Jesus is doing while the disciples are heading to Bethsaida. Now, there's lots of names of cities in that part of the world that begin with Beth. Beth means house. Bethlehem means house of bread. And Bethsaida means house of fishers. So Jesus is sending the 12 back to the house of fishers. And look what happens. All of the seas turn against them. And the waves are blowing against them. And I think that's a, a small sermon that Jesus was giving his disciples. You can't go back there again. Once you put your hand to the plow, you can't turn to the left or to the right. You have to proceed ever on. You can't go back to your own old livelihood of being fishers. You need to turn in the other direction. And so here they're fighting the waves, fighting the waves and the wind in life. I don't know about you, but I have wasted a lot of years of my life doing that very same thing, fighting the wind that's in my face and fighting the waves without realizing that the Lord God Almighty is telling me, turn around. Don't keep fighting against that which you can't overcome. It said they were making some headway, but probably not much. Now during this season of vacation, many of your people are going to the shore and they're being faced with riptides. We hear about it every summer that people get in a riptide and all of a sudden they're swimming along the shore of the Gulf of Mexico and all of a sudden they're being sent out into deep waters. And what is the, what do most people do? They want to fight against the riptide. And we've been taught, and it comes on the news every year, do not fight against the riptide. The riptide is going to win every time. You either go parallel to the shore, either one way or the other. And that's what Jesus, when he gets into the boat and calms their fears, he turns them around. They're not going to uh, Bethsaida, which is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. He turns them around, and now they're heading west, and they're going to which means Garden of the Prince. Isn't that a peaceful spot for them to be heading to? Now the wind is at their back. No longer are they fighting the waves of life, but they're being pushed by the waves because they're going finally in the right direction. And when they get there, all of the people that greet them get this, and this is quote unquote from Holy Scripture, the people recognize Jesus, but the disciples still are in their own little cl cloud of fog. They still do not quite get it. Their hearts are still hard. And in spite of seeing all the things that they have seen Jesus do, they still don't get it. It could not be more evident as to what Jesus wants to disciples, even, even using these words, take heart. When we began our worship, after beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we begin with the collect of purity. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known. In other words, we have to have our hearts opened in order to worship the Lord God Almighty. So we begin with that, having an open heart, to be absolutely bare before the Lord God Almighty so that we can uh, know him and be known by him. And then in a few minutes, we will approach the holy table. And what do we do there? And you get, this is where it becomes, a, uh, you get to participate in the sermon. You don't get to do that very often. But what do I say? Lift up your hearts. 
I'm going to give you a C minus on that. <laughs> but this is a retake. Lift up your hearts. A plus. There you have it. You see where it is? Only love can break a heart, and only love can mend it again. See, Jesus wants to give us a heart transplant. He wants to remove our heart of stubbornness and stone and to give us a heart of grace and mercy. He wants us to be tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. And this is what Jesus says to his disciples when he gets them in the right direction. When he gets on the boat and gets them turned around. This is what Jesus says. Take heart. It is I. Have no fear. In the name of God, Father, Son.